Live from the 607 is the ODPH Entertainment Edition, where we're talking movies, comics, TV, and more. Why don't you join in the conversation? Hashtag ODPH, because here we go. Welcome to another edition of the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour, hashtag ODPH podcast. I am your host, Ken M. Seeing across me this week is the one, the only, Padawan J. Hello, hello, hello. Folks, we have a lot to discuss, so we're not going to waste any more time. Hashtag it up with us. Hashtag ODPH. Join in that conversation on social media because, hey, we want to talk with you about movies, TV, comics, all things entertainment, and there is no bigger story in entertainment than Marvel Studios' Captain Marvel. Woo! dominating this weekend at uh, the box we'll, office. Let's say one would say the bo- their box office number went higher, further, and faster. Absolutely. We are going to be talking spoilers because we went opening night. Shout out to everybody that was down in the theater with us. And let me tell you this. We're going into spoilers, as I said, three, two, one. It was amazing. Yeah. It was definitely a movie that lived up to the hype. Mm-hmm. Wasn't really sure how it was going to be because it was flashbacks, and obviously it was teased at the end of Infinity War Mm -hmm. when we saw Nick Fury uh, fall to the decimation snap, or Mm -hmm. devastation snap, the snap, we'll just call it that. Yep. And you saw that he was whipping his beeper out, and he was trying to get a hold of somebody. We saw the Captain Marvel symbol. Yep. Brie Larson was playing Carol Danvers in the movie. Really did not know a lot more going into it other right. than it was going to be based around in the 90s mm-hmm. as we found out 1995 to be specific yep and it was going to deal with the Kree and the scrolls and we were going mm-hmm. to have the version i guess of the Kree scroll war we'll say in the antithesis of setting shield on the path it would become to go on that we know in the movies mm-hmm. we saw samuel L. jackson reprises his role as nick fury mm-hmm. our favorite shield director yes clark Gregg reprising his role as phil colson mm-hmm. and where they went from there it was very interesting so mm-hmm. pat let me ask you what was your thoughts on the movie i re- you know i really enjoyed the movie you know yes it was a little bit of a stereotypical marvel origin movie but you know that formula has proven to work you don't if it works you don't need to reinvent the wheel it inter- it introduced her character the, I loved how they kind of gave the backstory of like how she got her powers and what kind of happened to Little Mystery, and it slowly in, enveloped as you watch the movie. Um, I will say that, it, it, to me, the movie was great in introducing her, showing why she is the badass that she is and will become as we go further down the uh, movie timeline. Yeah, I have to agree with you. I mean, going into the movie, like I said, I really wasn't sure a definitive idea what to expect. Mm -hmm. We're talking prequels. We're talking origin stories. A lot of hype behind it. And obviously, this was a huge movie for Marvel. Right. Because obviously, anything coming out after Avengers Infinity War, a lot of eyes were going to be watching. Mm -hmm. How is this going to tie in? And when we got right down to it, they did a great job of explaining Carol Danvers' story. Mm Mm-hmm. They did bits and pieces of her pre-Captain Marvel time, though. Yep. So you don't really have a lot of her Earth backstory. Mm -hmm. You just kind of have the sense that she had a very tough childhood. It was not exactly, you know, peaches and cream, so to speak. As they say, not everything was nice. But you saw that her character had the will to get up and keep fighting and Mm -hmm. keep, you know, believing in herself and just kind of found that spirit. Because when we find her, she's part of the Kree Star Force. Yep. That is one member or one faction, should I say, of the Cree military. Yep. And we really don't know a lot about them. We've had them teased before in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Mm-hmm. So this was our first real glimpse of said group. Yeah. And you're kind of noticing, okay, this group is saying, well, we have to defend the galaxy from the scrolls. The scrolls are the enemies. and Yeah, they're that- run by the Central Intelligence, which I was giving a very heavy. Is it a lot like, you know, Central Intelligence is you know, robotic, you know, AI mind. And I'm watching the film going, is this what happens if, you know, the Terminator uh, timeline goes in like a good direction? You have to wonder because this was a kind of interesting take from the comic because the Supreme Intelligence, which in the comics has been this huge and I mean, Mm -hmm. gigantic green head hooked up with, you know, wires and such. And to see how it was portrayed in the MCU was a very different tell. I, th- I feel like that makes sense, though, because if they go with the giant green head, there are going to be a lot of people making comparisons to the Wizard of Oz. Yeah, and rightfully so. I, because, like I said, when the, the Supreme Intelligence was first created by Marvel Comics, I believe it was in the 1970s. Right. So 
this time is in that and if you notice any kind of cosmic you know entities during you know the early stages of comics you know they're always kind of larger than life and they mm-hmm. look very different they're very unique and it's a great it's a great thing that all the creators have done over the years yeah because obviously you don't want aliens looking like humans and stuff right. and going from there right so when they decided to do this you know incarnation of it we see Annette Benning who we think at the time is the supreme intelligence mm-hmm. and as it kind of breaks down however the Cree soldiers or whoever is connecting with the supreme intelligence is seeing a character they know and they trust mm-hmm. be their that representation which i thought was such a unique take on it yeah because as we see in that benning and she does look human and we don't really know what's going on there mm-hmm. we kind of see that you know she's trying to guide brie larson's character and you know to you know f- what the mission is and what her yep. purpose is and going from there and as we see uh, Captain Marvel is getting trained by Jan Rog, mm-hmm. who was uh, played by Jude Law. Yep. And at this point, we thought there was a lot of speculation that he was actually going to be the original Captain Marvel. Right. And there was even some stuff like the last six months to a year where, like, Marvel, for whatever reason at the time we didn't know, wouldn't say his character's name. Like, online leaks and stuff would flip back and forth on the daily. Yeah. Which, I mean, is a good thing, too, because I like going to movies and being surprised. We live in such a day and age where everything gets leaked out that mm-hmm. when you go to the theater, it's kind of like, I don't want to say a letdown, but right. it's just not the big mystique of just like the huge reveal. Yeah. So obviously this character was very interesting to see and how it was going to play out. And as they as they go on from just a simple routine recon mission, yep. it kind of spirals out of control and Captain Marvel crashes to Earth in the 1990s. Mm-hmm. And this is where things get kind of interesting because now the scrolls are coming to Earth and you see the one Talos, mm-hmm. who, like I said, I don't really don't remember a lot in the comics, but Ben Mendelsohn, yep. I hope I pronounced that right, uh, you know, is on Earth and trying to re- get with Captain Marvel and find out what she knows because he, when they captured her from the original recon mission, they're digging into her memories and they've unlocked something. Right, and it, like you clearly know that she knows something or she has some piece of information locked in her head from her her past memories which you know because of the accident that happened she has no recollection of she sees bits and pieces of them but she has no idea what they are where they are who they are or anything and the scrolls start digging through it and they go oh yeah she knows it she knows it she knows it and it like on the surface when you're watching it you're going okay this is real creepy like they're not good about this They, they want this for all the wrong reasons right and like i said we are talking heavy spoilers here on this when the scrolls finally meet up with captain marvel obviously she is programmed to think a certain way, and, yep. and she is just like, no, they're the enemy. And as the movie progresses and you see her, and one thing I thought was such a, a nice thing to see is when you see her interacting with a young Nick Fury, mm-hmm. just their comedic timing yes. was spot on. Yes. Could not have yes. casted it any better. Yeah, you just get the feeling that like Brie Larson and Samuel L. Jackson just hung out for a week. Oh, my God, yeah. Like, like they were it's long so na- Like, it's so natural. It was such a natural vibe between them because they're given one-liners back and forth. Oh, yeah. And this is one thing I, I do get sometimes critical about when I say it's like the Thor yeah. Ragnarok formula. Yeah. It's just there's a heavy dose of humor. But for this it film, worked. It worked. It yeah. worked. Like, you think to the bar scene where it's about midway through the movie where at this point Fury is fully aware of who the Skrulls are and what's going on, and he meets up and he tracks down Brie Larson. And, you know, they're meeting in a bar and she goes, how do I know I can trust you? And, you know, he goes, well, you, I'm me. And they go through this whole questioning thing and, you know, they go through that. And he goes, well, how do I know you're not a scroll? And she just shoots a photon blast into the jukebox behind him. And he goes, you know, without missing a beat and just goes, and I'm supposed to trust you on that? Yeah, it was just such a, a cool moment. And it was just something like we say, it was just a natural. Like, yeah. it, it didn't feel forced. It didn't feel like they were really struggling to seem like a genuine friendship was being formed. Mm-hmm. And as they go on from there, they're obviously getting chased by the scrolls. We find out the Kree is now coming to Earth yep. to obviously retrieve Captain Marvel, but we find out there's a little more ulterior motive going on as we mm-hmm. as we progress. And as they start going through their journey to uncover the mystery, we start finding out more truth about Carol Danvers and who she is. Uh-huh. And obviously they introduce another interesting character, Maria Rambeau, who's played by Lashana Lynch. Mm-hmm. And we also meet her daughter, Monica. Yep. So they're piecing together what happened because apparently six years prior, Carol Danvers is involved in a plane crash and disappears. Yep. And it is with the original Captain Marvel, as we find out, who is played by Annette Benning. Yep. Which is uh, which was a nice, cool gender flip because in the comics, Captain Marvel, 
Marvel is male, and it was su- it was such a surprise too because I could I was sitting in the theater trying to think back like if we had ever seen her in the, like any of the trailers or ads or anything I couldn't remember seeing her. I don't remember seeing her at all. I remember she was casted, and right? Been so tight lipped, but right. But the early word was she was a supreme intelligence, right? But to see her actually be Captain Marvel, mm-hmm. the original Kree spy that came to Earth, and right? Where they go from there, and then as you find out the whole backstory of. The Kree captured Carol Danvers because she absorbed mm-hmm. the energy that was from the power source that everybody has been chasing. Right, of the warp uh, warp drive thing they were looking for. It was a warp drive that she was also infused with Kree DNA, as it mm-hmm. appears to be. So she was turned into basically a weapon for the Kree military, yeah. which was a very somewhat connected to the comic, somewhat not. Sure. It made sense, though, from the purpose for the movie. So, yeah. like I said, I don't struggle with that too much. But as she's finding out her backstory, she's finding out more is involved, and we find out what the true power source of this all, you know, intergalactic chase is. Mm-hmm. The Tesseract. That damn thing. From Captain America, the first Avenger. The Avengers movie. Yeah. You know, the space gem. Yep. From the Infinity Gauntlet. So this is now all, you know, as we say, Marvel brings everything all together. Yeah, I did not see the Tesseract showing up in any way, shape, or form in this movie, so that was an awesome surprise. It was, definitely was. And it kind of brings up more questions, and if you want to really piece together, obviously Howard Stark, when he was looking for Captain America, found mm-hmm. the Tesseract. and mm-hmm. Died in, if the, if the stuff I read online, he died in 1992 uh, in the MCU timeline, uh, so this movie takes place in 95. So there, there are, if you look long enough on the internet, there are internet sleuths trying to piece together the history and timeline of the Tesseract. Yeah, because this is where it kind of gets interesting of when Howard Stark turned it over to S.H.I.E.L.D. and when mm-hmm. it went to Project Pegasus, right. which if you know anything about the Marvel comics, that's a long-standing uh government agency yep. facility type deal. So that has a lot of history. It is kind of, it is a nice little, you know, Easter egg for the mm-hmm. MCU. So where this is all connected, it's really interesting because then the Tesseract is off planet at this point and nobody can find it, which I thought was very interesting mm-hmm. because you would figure that everybody on earth is looking for this. Loki is looking for this at some point. It wouldn't just, you know, magically disappear off the radar without anybody right. looking for it. And like, and how well was that covered up mm-hmm. that, Nobody could find it yeah. for all this time. See, I kind of look at it as being kind of like the One Ring in Lord of the Rings, where like it's been around and it was around for like thousands and thousands and thousands of years, but like it just kind of had a mind of its own. You know, it's written in the books and in the movies that it has a mind of its own, and it just kind of sat there and waited. Mm. I I think of something similar to the Tesseract, where it's been around since the formation of the universe. It's this all powerful gem, one of you know six. It might have had a slight mind of its own that it's like you know what I'm just gonna sit here and wait. Yeah, it was something that. It was very interesting to see how they played it off. And now where they're going with it, you know, Captain Marvel takes Nick Fury, Maria, Rambo, mm-hmm. and uh, Talos up to the space station where we find that there, it's been hiding with Skrulls. Yep. And I thought this was kind of interesting how they're, you know, really made a departure from the Skrulls that you see in the comics. Right. Because the Skrulls are more of a conquering uh, alien race, mm-hmm. more... I don't want to say barbaric, but they're just more. You know, I kind of say like they're almost like alien Vikings, almost. Like, right. That's the way I would kind of treat them because they're they're known to just be very you know fighting and and yeah not not in a peaceful manner. So to kind of see this take on them, I thought was very interesting. Oh, I think they're selling a line of crap, and Captain Marvel and Fury are buying it. Oh, I think so too. And I think I think everything Talos was doing was manipulating everybody from the behind the scenes. I say if, if the scrolls are as dominating and as powerful as they are, you don't get to that point without learning a few things and, you know, doing a few things. And I feel like he's I feel like, you know, he knows how powerful Captain Marvel is and he knows what she can do and you know, I think it's one of those things where, you know, he's like, "All right, I'm going to use every ounce of cunning I have in my being to work this to my advantage." Yeah, and it made perfect sense that he's obviously manipulating the situation because I don't think that everything's been on the up and up. And as, no. we, as we know, when Jude Law's character and, and the rest of the Star Force come, this is when everything hits the fan, mm-hmm. and the truth is now finally revealed. Yep. And this is where the big fight scene goes on, and this is where you know, as it comes to be, Captain Marvel de- winds up defeating her old team. Mm-hmm. And sending the message back to the Kree army that she's coming back to end this once and for all. Mm-hmm. And it seems like that she's siding with the Skrulls. And as she disappears from Earth, you know, she says her goodbye to Monica Rambeau. Yep. Pad, why do you think that's important? I, I don't know. In Marvel Comics, 
Monica Rambeau becomes Captain Marvel oh, okay. at some point. Okay. She does develop powers, and she has the Captain Marvel mantle for a, a duration of time. Then she becomes Photon, and I believe she is now Spectrum in the comics. Okay. So she becomes a hero later on down the road. Right. You know, and obviously there is not the connection, you know, there's a loose connection to Carol Danvers. Right, so right. So this is something that I thought was very interesting that they are now playing because as we jump forward in the movie, you know, everybody's saved the day. Nick Fury has a very violent flirt and pet yep. that he's watching because yep. as we find out, as in the comics, uh, Carol Danvers' cat is not exactly a nice, sweet cat. Right, and they kind of allude to that throughout the movie where the Skrulls first meet Goose, and they're, like, freaking the hell out about it. And, and initially, you just kind of chalk it up to, okay, it's just one of those things where, like, they're scared of certain things that on our planet are really we really enjoy. But then you find out, no, yeah, this thing is, like, this small alien monster that can, like, swallow anything at all. And, yeah, no, the uh, fear is justified. Yes, because, obviously, we find out, and like we said, we've been talking all segment, we are talking spoilers. We find out this is the reason Nick Fury loses his eye. Oh, see, people have been calling that. I know people are mad about that because, oh, it's cheap, it's this, it's that. People have been calling this since the cat made an appearance on the first trailer. I know. And for me, because the way I have known Nick Fury. Sure. The original way he lost it was to grenade shrapnel. Sure. Saving the, saving the day. So to see this, me personally, I thought was... I was not exactly happy about this, but I'm okay with it. Like, See, I'm, the other thing could be, and I I can't take credit for this. I've seen this online in a few places. How do we know she attacked? Uh, how do we know the cat attacked the real Nick Fury? Well, the only thing I would think of is if he attacked a scroll, mm-hmm. he would start bleeding green. That's true. So that's I, I already ruled that out. I was thinking the same thing that maybe this is. Because as we find out a little more about the scrolls' powers and you know how far their memories go back, that yeah, if this was going to tie into it, then maybe this would have made some sense. But yeah. or, but we see when he's originally cut, he's bleeding red. Right. So unless something happens between then and you know later on in the film after right. Captain Marvel leaves, right, where she's now this is where she does the time jump and she disappears. Yeah. But she also leaves behind the the beacon slash beeper. Yeah. That Nick Fury can get a hold of her. So. I think the theory that Fury is a scroll at this point, I think that it's going to come down the road because I think Talos stays. Right. Because there's a weird interaction where they shake hands after Talos is injured at one point. Yep. And he's like, are you feeling okay? And he's like, I'm better now. Yeah, and and I know there have been people speculating online that the reason Fury didn't get his eye replaced because there is the scene toward towards the end of the movie where Coulson brings in the briefcase looking thing with the replacement eyes. And uh, there has been some speculation online that, like, as much of a planner and, and preparation man as Fury is, the reason he didn't replace his eye is he was planning in case the scrolls came back. And, hey, they try to assimilate me or try to copy me. They won't be able to copy my eye. And it's a smart move by him. Absolutely. But that's that's a Fury Nick, move. That's Nick Fury to the letter. To the letter. Mm-hmm. And, obviously, he's made some headway at S.H.I.E.L.D. because now he is starting the Protector Project. Mm-hmm. And we find out that Carol Danvers... Uh, Name or a plane name mm-hmm. was Avenger. Yep, when she was in the Air Force, so he's now changed it to the, the Avengers Initiative, which is a fun nod. Oh, it's a fun nod. Like it was just fun overall. So, Pat, let me ask you this: So, moving forward with the MCU, mm-hmm. and we did, say, or we we got to talk about the bonus scene. Yeah, of course. Okay, you want to break it down for our listeners? So, you get to the mid credit scene. It's right after the fancy schmancy credits, and you see a holographic image projection in uh, the Avengers uh, base in upstate New York, where you see a you know hollow, hollow projection of Earth with a counter going up, and it is astronomically high, like over a billion, if I remember right. And then this, you know, as the camera uh, pans out, the globe is spinning and it's showing individual countries, and you come to find out uh, this isn't counting just anything random. No, it is counting the total number of missing people mm-hmm. and it's got uh who is there uh black widow is there cap war, is there war machine war machine is there was uh hulk was there hulk was there so they're all kind of like you know slack jawed oh my god this is horrible and come to find out they have found the beeper pager of nick fury using to get carol danvers now how they knew this and how they found out we don't know this could be i kind of view this as a scenario like where we got the uh, bonus scene for civil war where you know that was midway through so they they found the beeper pager where Fury was using it to page Captain Marvel. They don't know what it's for, but they know Fury had it, and if Fury had it and was using it, it is important. And they've been using some of the technology and, and smarts at their disposal to boost its signal because they know 
if Fury's paging someone with this thing, they are very important. Mm-hmm. And they, you know, Cap says, keep trying, keep trying. And uh, they turn around, and who's there but Carol Danvers saying, where's Fury? Right. So now this is officially introduced Carol Danvers, a.k.a. Captain Marvel, mm-hmm. into the current MCU timeline. Yep. Because, like we said, there is now a 20-year jump right. between movies. Right. So it's going to be interesting to see how this goes, because this is what I was going to ask you, Pat. Yeah. So where do you see her character now going from here? Because we're going to have the Avengers mm-hmm. Endgame coming up. Yeah. She's going to play a very vital role in that. Yeah. But after that, where ha- where do we go from here with Captain Marvel? I think it's going to be more of the, and it, this is going to kind of tie into where she's been in the last 20 years or so. I think she's been off dealing with the scroll Cree, you know, stalemate, I guess you could call it. And I think it's going to be a furthering of that where, you know, you might start to see the scrolls aren't as timid as she's been led to believe in that they're starting to fight back a little bit. And it's, it's escalating a little bit more than where it was in the past. Yeah, I have to agree. I think that now she's I think for the sequel, she's going to be breaking down where she's been mm-hmm. for the past 20 years. So I think we're going to have another time jump movie, sure. which I'm completely yeah, fine with because yeah. we don't need to have necessarily everything right now in the MCU. Like when they've done time jumps. For example, with Captain America, the first Avenger. Mm-hmm. I thought that was fine. Yeah. And then now, obviously, with Captain Marvel being in the 90s. And I thought they did a very nice representation for yeah. the music. Yeah. Even, I will have to admit, I I had a good laugh and kind of to be expected when there was the huge fight scene. Yep. And it was a soundtrack from, no doubt, Just mm-hmm. a Girl. Yeah. And, it, I mean, it fit for the movie because they were so entrenched in the 90s. You know, from the look to the sound mm-hmm. to just everything about it, it kind of, it even kind of felt like a '90s action yeah. film, yeah. Which I thought was just a very interesting vibe to see. You know, obviously we're talking how many, you know, how many years difference now, twenty mm-hmm. years difference, just to capture that essence. And I thought it was a well, well yeah. done job. And I think if they're going to do, obviously they're going to do a sequel to this. Oh God, yeah. I fully the, think the movie just crossed five hundred million dollars worldwide today as we record. Yeah. They're obviously going to be doing a sequel, and where they go from here, I could see another flashback to where she's been from this yeah. 20 years. And yeah. obviously, that, I think, might be a more truer representation of the Kree Skrull War. Because yeah. we just kind of had a little taste of yeah, it. See, you got one side of it. You know, what she saw was true from a certain point of view. You mm-hmm. know, you get you got to see one side of it. I think with, with the sequel, you're going to see the full picture from a person who's like, all right, I'm not on either side of this, so let me let me get this solved. Right, because like I say, this is an old Avenger story mm-hmm. that I know they did Operation Galactic Storm and kind of right. rebrought it back, but but that was tying in more with the Shi'ar. And obviously, as we're going to be talking later in the show about the Disney Fox deal is almost done. I don't think they're going to be incorporating that storyline into the movie. I think they're going to keep it just between the Kree and the Skrull mm-hmm. and where they go with that. And I think that that'll just lead right up to when she returns. Or they're going to kind of have to do like a flashback that maybe this is where Secret Invasion happens. Right. And they come back and forth. I also think in the sequel we're going to see Monica Rambeau now fully grown. Yeah. Because in the movie, I want to say that she was, if I read correctly, she was around 11 years old. Yep. So if this is... Give or take. Yeah, give or take. So you figure at 20 years, she's Mm -hmm. now an adult. Right. She's probably going to have her powers. And there was the standing offer from Fury for her mother to work with S.H.I.E.L.D. Yeah, so I think this is all going to kind of coincide of her now becoming the hero that we will know. I'm going to say we're going to assume as Spectrum. Sure. That when she is now fully integrated into the MCU. Because after Avengers Endgame, we're going to have a new Avengers team. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, will she be on that team? I, I don't know. I would like to think so. I would like to think so. I think Captain Marvel is going to be the head of it, yeah. the new team. So I don't know if they would pair Spectrum on that same team. Right. Or would they go into a different team? Who knows? I mean, this is what's going to be really interesting to close out this phase of the MCU because mm-hmm. this is now phase three, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Phase four will start with Spider-Man Far From Home. Mm-hmm. So going in with this, there's so many possibilities they can go. But to close out the segment, final thoughts on the movie, Pad. Love the movie. Love the characters and casting and the writing and everything. I The one thing I do want to, I can't wait for the Blu-ray to come out, just so I can pause the scenes in where she's walking through the blockbuster and see, like, all right, that blockbuster was, like, scary accurate of how blockbuster actually looked back in the day. I want to know how accurate they got the movies, if there were, like, actual legit 90s VHSs in there, because I'm kind of curious. Love the movie overall, though. I want to say there were, because if I'm not mistaken, the cutout that was that was ripped apart yeah. was True Lies. Oh, uh, yep, yep. And I want to say the movie was the right stuff Yep, from back then. Yeah. And I can I can see Marvel just raiding, like, every Goodwill and, like, local, you know, pop, mom and pop shop where, like, they have old VHSs and old stuff like that and just raiding everyone that had a 90s movie in, like, a 100-mile radius. You know, maybe, but Marvel did such a, uh, an amazing job to recapture the 90s yeah. with this. 
that like I said, everything from the music to even like how it's shot and how it was felt. Like mm-hmm. to me, it just felt like a big '90s action movie. Yeah, like I mean, that's the era I grew up in, so yeah. I understand that completely. Yeah. And the one thing too, which I thought was such a, a cool nod, as with this movie is with Stan Lee's cameo. Yes. That now that they have redone the intro where they usually do the comic book pages flipping, mm-hmm. it was an, it was a nice little tribute to Stan Lee. Yep. And we did see one of his last cameos. Well, he, well, and then also the other thing was they show the Marvel the Marvel logo and it's going through the actual letters and it's scenes from the various movies over the years. Like I I remember there, uh, the one there's like the scene of like Scarlet Witch and Old Age of Ultron. Like they replaced that and it's all his cameos from yeah. all the movies. Yeah, I mean it was just such a cool thing to open oh, up the it's movie. So and, great. I mean the, the theater we were at gave a standing ovation for uh, it. I, from what I've read about, that's practically true for every showing, and rightfully so. And even his cameo where he was reading the script to Mallrats, uh-huh. the Kevin Smith classic. Yeah, which which classic. Put, which put Kevin Smith in tears when he saw the movie. Well, because Stan Lee, that, if I'm not mistaken, and please correct me if I'm wrong about this on ODPH uh, hashtag on Twitter, this was Stan Lee's first real cameo in a movie mm-hmm. was Mallrats. Yep. And it's a classic one. Yep. It's not safe for work, yeah. but it's classic. But that means Mallrats is uh, canon in MCU timeline. Oh my! Oh my! My worlds are are colliding with the, mm-hmm. with the Kevin there, Smith universe. There's a photo of like Kevin Smith tweeted out after he saw the movie where he is just a blubbering mess, and rightfully so. That was an awesome nod. It was an awesome nod, and and just uh, awesome just representation in the '90s, and just where they went with Captain Marvel. Brie Larson did a great job with the film, mm-hmm. and like I said, the comedic timing. I don't think I can get enough like credit to her and Samuel no, Jackson. No. Because they were just going back and forth like old friends, and even yeah. though they just met, yeah. you know, on, on the screen here, their characters, they just kind of seemed, you know, so natural mm-hmm. that the humor. Like I said, I usually criticize too much when sure. it's when it has like for me, I call it the Thor Ragnarok feel, the forced humor, the forced humor, the characters that you know you don't think are like this funny or, or cracking this many one liners. But I didn't mind it with this. Right, this one had just a nice balance of humor and action. And just an overall feel of just the newest hero on the block. And she is going to obviously make some headway leading into the next phase of the MCU mm-hmm. that she'll be the focal point of the new phase four, in my opinion. Yeah. And it makes perfect sense. So if you haven't gone out to see Captain Marvel, you need to get out and go see it. Yep. It definitely lived up to expectation. But if you have seen it, hit us up on that hashtag ODPH. If you haven't, let us know why you haven't, and we'll you know have a little discussion about that. So hit us up. Let us know what you think of Captain Marvel. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hey, this is Vince, the Common Man, CTO, a local MMA fighter, telling you to keep on listening to the ODPH, the 607's up-and-coming newest podcast. Come back for segment number two on this week's ODPH. And this edition, you know we talk entertainment. We talk about one of our favorite shows. Mm -hmm. And this one had a heavyweight fight. Yep. Finally, uh, make its longstanding appearance on. Uh We're talking The Walking Dead. We are talking Daryl versus Beta. We're talking spoilers. Pad, break it down for us. Holy crap, the fight scene between Daryl and Beta. How did Beta not die? That is my question. This is comic books. This is TV. That's the only way I can explain it because as we jump into the episode, Daryl, Connie have rescued Henry and Lydia from mm-hmm. the Whispers yep. in a very bold, know, sta- bold strategy. Bold strategy, without question. They, because got, they got a pair of stones on them, that's for sure. Because they decided to go right into, you know, their their home camp yeah. where the thousands... Or they walked hun- in their kitchen, stole their food, and left. Yeah, this was just like a, a completely... I don't also want to say it was like a suicide mission because... Kind of, because there were a whole bunch of walkers out there. Yeah, this was just a not well-planned idea by Daryl, but it's uh, Daryl. It, was a, it so, was a half-planned idea. Yeah, but this one could have just went so badly, and just it was two against an army of... It appeared like hundreds and thousands. Mm-hmm. Like it was just... I mean, it, I'm sure it's a couple hundred at least. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So as their escape now... They've taken Lydia back to, I'm assuming they're going back to Alexandria, yep. and Alpha has now sent Beta, her right-hand man, to go get them. Yeah, you know, it's like, she's real pissed off. She's like, all right, I'm going to skip the pawns, 
in the Knights if we're talking chess here. I'm going to send my right-hand dude here. Go yeah. get him. And this one, Daryl knew as he rescued Lydia, he knew Lydia had not been on the up and up with him about everything. Yeah. And Lydia, though, I will say, had her reasons. Yeah. You you captured me. How did I know what you were going to do to me? Yeah. So she, She's got a point. She had a point. And as we say, this season, this half of the season anyway, Daryl has now been thrusted into the leadership role. This is uncharted water for him. Mm-hmm. So now he has to make those decisions on the fly. Yeah. And as we see, when he's trying to make decisions, he's now getting some resistance from his camp. Mm-hmm. Connie, who has been a nice counterbalance to yeah. him, and just their interaction is she's, I don't want to say being like, you know, his, his conscience, so to speak. Right. But. She has been very assertive in saying, no, we need to save her. We need to bring her back with us. She's, she's the Daryl to uh, Rick's Daryl. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of an interesting role flip. Yeah. That now Daryl needs somebody to kind of talk some sense into him, and mm-hmm. Connie has done an excellent job with this because now they're on the run. And But this is typical Daryl that, all right, where Rick would have gone straight back to camp, Daryl is saying, no, we're going to set up shop and we're going to end this once and for all. Yeah, Daryl, uh, Rick would have absolutely gone back to camp, set up shop, fortify the defenses, arm every man, woman, child, and baby, and then fought tooth and nail. Daryl's being a little more smart about it. Well, well, hold on, let's back off here. Well, this is, like I say, the easiest comparison I could say to this is this is when Wolverine is running the X-Men. Yeah. This is not Cyclops. Yeah. This is Wolverine. Well, you got to also figure Daryl's very much a, a hunter in, mm-hmm. the, in that, and I mean that in the literal sense that like he hunted things for fun and game. And now in the in the dead universe, I guess you could call it, he's still a hunter. So I, I think this is kind of his. You know, he he was Rick's right hand man for so long, so he's got a bit of leadership experience by osmosis, I guess you could say. But it's also his hunter instincts kicking in of okay, we could go through this and do this, you know, the way Rick would have done it, but. I know better, and I've seen a few things. Yeah, this is one where he really has to make the the tough call mm-hmm. and the setup shot because he knows everybody's going to come back to camp, and now he's seen you know the hundreds that are in the yeah, Whisper Army yeah. coming. I would say he's seen this this show before, and I don't mean that in the literal sense. I mean he's seen the outcome before, where like you you take someone from another camp that is highly sought or highly prized, and what happens if you go back to your camp? Nothing good. Right. So he is trying to eliminate the threat best he can. And they set up shop in, in an abandoned building. Mm-hmm. And this is where it got like an really... apartment complex or something? It seemed it. Because this is where things got really interesting. And you really kind of see Daryl on his own and what he does in a solo situation. Right. And I love that that whole thing where they, they planned on going into that like high-rise apartment complex. Because that was bringing bring back memories from when I read one of the governor... Uh, novels where I think it's the first one where it's like right as the out- outbreak is happening where the the group the governor is with they go into a similar building where they're like and, and for the same train of thought oh high rise they won't be able to get up here and if we're quiet they'll never know we're here and no one will know we're here yeah so it made sense but obviously beta being a hunter in his own right as yeah, it appears he's no idiot there's more to him than we have found out just yet mm-hmm. you see him track th- down the group and is leading an attack into the building. Yep. And he obviously knows it's a trap, mm-hmm. but he's still coming. Oh, yeah. Which, like so, I said, the vibe I got, and I, I know I keep referencing it, it was like Wolverine versus Sabretooth. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah no, re- realistically, and I and I got the vibe of the whole, he knew the trap is uh, from Reven- Star Wars Revenge of the Sith. You know, oh, this must be a trap? You know, it's, it's totally a trap. So what's the next move? Spring the trap. Yep. And he went right into it. Oh, my Lord. He ran through that drywall. Holy crap. Yeah, where Daryl had been picking off members of the Whisper camp. Uh-huh. Beta just ran through like the Kool-Aid man of the old TV oh, show. So he ran, or, he TV ran commercials. through like Mean Joe Green. Holy yeah, crap. He just ran right through. Oh, my God. And just went straight attack mode. And this was the fight that, like I said, I've been waiting to see. Yeah. Because with Daryl not being in the comics, but we've seen Beta. Yeah, this one was a very interesting. Okay, how are they going to do this? And it was like a heavyweight fight. I'll say because if this if this was like you know Rick versus Beta, it would have been five minutes of Rick getting his absolute butt kicked before he might have like pulled out a win. But this this was like a heavyweight title fight. Yeah, when they started whipping out their knives, like I instantly thought this is like Wolverine versus Saber Tooth. This yeah. is like mirror images. Yeah, just, just you know little differences here and there, but yeah. they're almost like the same character, so y- to speak. You really think about it, yeah. And just to see them go at it, and they didn't hold back. I mean, kudos to their choreography team yeah. because they really were making, you know, like this was just a knockdown drag fight that it should have been. Yeah, and like I said last week, you know, Daryl or uh, Norman Reedus tweeted an article. That fight scene was three pages long. 
Yeah, and and rightfully so because it did enough justice to both characters. Oh, it was awesome. And then, like I said, we are talking spoilers. And to see how it ended, where Daryl tricked Beta and, mm-hmm. and threw him down an elevator shaft. And I was convinced he was dead because you hear clunk, 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 and I'm thinking, all right, they're not showing it, but that sounds like him hitting his head a couple times on the way down. Right. So, I mean, obviously, we're talking comics and it's TV. So, I mean, she sure it's just plus it's that, not too that easy. plus that fall looked like it was about three stories. It did look. It did look deep. It but, was at least two. But Daryl did the telltale sign. Yeah, he didn't look. We didn't look. No, nope. D- didn't see a body. Nope. He's fine. Comics one hundred and one. Yep. But I do love the fact that he just decided to give him the spit, picked up his knife, and walked. Yeah, that was cool. Just you know, that was that's Daryl. That was the official mic drop and walk off in the sunset. Mm-hmm. And then as we see on the other side of the coin, the f- the festival fair mm-hmm. is now picking up speed. We are introduced to a new group. Uh huh. Known as the Highwaymen. Yep. Now, this group has an interaction with the kingdom. Yep. And to my knowledge, they're not part of the comics universe. So Nothing refreshing my memory. So now we are dealing with a new group, and who, who are they? Where we, the hell have they been the entire time? Exactly. And as we see, they're trying to assert their authority on the kingdom. Yep. And Ezekiel and company confront them in, you know, I dare I say it's like a business meeting, but, uh, you know, in the Walking Dead universe, what is a business meeting without everybody drawing weapons? Yeah. So they're kind of saying, well, here we are, so how are we going to work together? Mm -hmm. Because the highwaymen are looking for payment for safe travel for everybody going to the fair. Mm -hmm. And the kingdom is saying, no, but we will work out a deal with you. Yeah. And once the highwaymen think they have the the upper hand, here comes Ezekiel's army, and they take them captive. I I think it's a smart move on the kingdom's part because they've been there where it's the whole, you're going to do this or else. No, screw you. Fighting. I think that's that's just time and experience. And, hey, we've been down that road before where we just flat out say no. It hasn't worked for us the umpteen times we've tried it before. Why don't we go someplace else with this? Why don't we try something a little different? Well, I think you get to that stage where you have to. But the, is the kingdom team of Ezekiel and Carol, they have been down this road before. Yeah, they, they've seen some stuff. You know, they're probably one of the most seasoned factions on the show Mm -hmm. so obviously we don't know anything about this highwayman group yep other than their leader agreeing to work with each other for now yeah there's a there's a tentative agreement to work together so something tells me and this is like we said we can't think of if they're in the comics if we're wrong correct us on hashtag odph but i just get the feeling that like the instant something goes wrong with this like what's coming up with the fair uh yeah that agreement's gonna be off the table i think it's gonna be off the table but where it goes i don't know because carol is bringing up, do you want to go see a, a movie? Right. And just the whole thing about this movie projector, I mean, it almost seemed like too much comic relief. Yeah. You know, which I'm I'm so not used to in The Walking Dead. Right. The Walking Dead is not, hey, let's crack jokes and be happy because yeah. there's nothing that's happy about this what universe. If, what if, and I just this just occurred to me, what if the Highwaymen is the group that Negan might eventually take over? That, like, he gets out and he finds them and, hey, here's a group that needs a leader. You know what? It's a strong possibility because, as we see, he is now having that interaction with Michonne mm-hmm. about he's been you know watching the world from his cell and he's kind of you know picking apart everything that's been going on. Yep. So to say that he's going to stay caged up for long isn't right. Is, is a long shot at best because yeah. I see him getting out, and that's not a bad thing that this becomes his new group. Mm-hmm. Because I can't see him joining up with the Whispers. And no. like I said, everything we've seen in the comic is kind of up in the air. Yeah. Because they've, I mean, when you take Rick Grimes off the board, anything can happen yeah. on this show. Mm-hmm. And I know they slid in parts and pieces here and there and, and different characters and different roles. So to see where they go with this, I mean, this is where it's going to get really interesting. But I do like your theory, though, that he will take them and make them Saviors 2.0. Mm-hmm. They'll obviously take out their leader and then say, this is my group. Yep. Or is he, you know, going to use them to go fight Alpha? Right. And say, okay, this is your bigger threat. Let me show you, Michonne, I'm truly reformed. I'm going to take out your biggest that threat. Could, that could be too. We don't know because Negan is the biggest X factor at this moment. Mm-hmm. We don't know what he's thinking. And that's the beauty of his character because you would think, okay, he's going to, you know, flip and just go work for himself. He might not. Right. We don't know his long game. And I think that's a really nice piece to his character right now in the so story everybody else is playing checkers uh negan's playing four dimensional chess yeah and he's a step ahead of everybody right now and the scariest thing is he's just been doing this sitting in a jail cell mm-hmm. with one window yep everybody else has been sitting there having their own dramas and not working together and he's just been biding his time and making his plan oh yeah so now when he's going to get out he's going to meet the highwaymen and obviously 
whatever happens from there because mm-hmm. if you know the comic, the comic's gonna, not going to be the happiest thing to no. showcase the fair, and I imagine no. the TV show is going to be in the same vein. Yeah, it's going to get real nasty. It's going to get real nasty. A lot of things are going to happen. Um, I will give warnings that if you've only seen the TV show, without going too spoilery, if you did not handle Glenn's death yeah. very well, yeah. brace yourself when, yeah. they, when they have the fair. Yeah. All I'm going to say. So final thoughts on the episode pad. Love the fight, love the build up, and man oh man, the build up to the fair is so good. I have to agree with you. I thought they did Daryl versus Beta round one amazingly. Yeah. And just to see Beta survive at the end because <laughs> that was a burning shot, even though it looked like he lost all his teeth. Yeah. Beta's gonna be real pissed. To see him survive and Daryl now has a true enemy. Oh yeah, who's yeah. coming for blood? Who's coming solely for him? I yeah. mean, this is this is the first time, like, because Rick had the governor as his major yeah. villain, yep. and now he had Negan as his. I, See, the thing with the governor is the governor was not afraid to like twist the knife into other members of his group just to get at Rick. I mean, we saw this with Maggie's father, mm-hmm. you know, with with Herschel. You know, the same with Negan. Negan was very much. We saw, you know, Negan killed Glenn just to get at Rick and, and company. Thing with Beta, Beta, like, you could have an army in front of you. Beta's just going to run through him. He doesn't care about any of them. He's going to run through him like a running back in football, knock him all over just to get at Daryl. Yeah. Like, forget the rest of them. Daryl's mine. Like I said, this is why I make the comparison of Wolverine and Sabretooth. Yeah. This is the big battle we've been waiting for. And for me, waiting nine seasons to finally see that there's a right-hand man mm-hmm. or woman that is finally the threat to Daryl. Yeah. This is what I've been waiting to see. Like, where is his major antagonist? Yeah. This is what I've been waiting to see. So I'm excited to see where it goes. I thought they did the episode really well. And where they go heading towards the fair with only three episodes left is going to get really interesting. Oh, yeah. So definitely let us know. Hit us up on that hashtag, hashtag ODPH. Let us know what you thought of this week's Walking Dead. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hey, I'm Mike Pappy from Rye Bread, and you're listening to the ODPH. Coming back for another segment on this edition of the ODPH and Pad, we have some somewhat breaking news. Somewhat breaking news, somewhat major news. Break it down for us. Uh, news came out this morning as we record that Disney is set to acquire 21st Century Fox on March 20th. Now, this isn't rumor. This isn't innuendo. This isn't hearsay. Disney announced this themselves, meaning it's a done deal, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Yeah, so now the official countdown is on. Mm-hmm. So for everybody who has been speculating, when is this going through? How soon we're going to see the Fantastic Four, the X-Men? Join the MCU mm-hmm. pad. This is now where we can kind of a little breakdown of what everything's coming. Right. And so you may be wondering why they, if it's not going down until March 20th, why they announced it today. Well, they announced it today. It's a formal process. It's a required process by, you know, financial law, whatever you want to call it. So that it gives, you know, those who have uh, 20 stock in 21st century, so the shareholders, you know, they have until 5 p.m. Thursday to choose the amount of cash and Disney stock they want to receive or they can sell it off. Right, so this has to be done. It's just pretty much a formality yeah, at this point. Yeah, dot your eyes, cross your T's. But now we are officially set to have Disney acquire Fox properties, mm-hmm. and you know everything is coming with this deal. And yep. and so this is where for us as comic book fans, this is now when the Fantastic Four and mm-hmm. the X Men come home, and everyone involved with those uh, properties. Right. I think the only one that is not, and I think we were getting hit on this about social media, is Namor. Yep. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that's real messy. Yeah, that one is just a complicated process. I don't have enough information. To I don't think anybody does. It, it, it's, it it's one of those things that like I've never seen a definitive answer of who has the rights to name or nobody's really quite sure. Right. So that one we are still going to have to wait and see on. Yep. But for this, this is huge for on the comic level mm-hmm. of we now have the Fantastic Four and the X Men now coming. Let's say they can use the word mutant to the MCU. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's the bit that has to be one of the biggest takeaways. Yeah, let's say the Marvel movies have been going on for you know eleven years now, and in those eleven years, they have not been able to utter the word mutant. Right. So this is where things are going to get very interesting. Now, mm-hmm. obviously, the deal is going to get processed in March. Yep. So the next question everybody's going to be clamoring at well, is... Well, they've already been clamoring. Well, they've already been clamoring, but I think where we can kind of give some unofficial ODPH you know, guesses of what's going to happen is... Mm-hmm. 
obviously you are not going to see any of these characters appear in Avengers Endgame or Spider-Man Far From Home. Let me let me just put it to you this way. This is in all caps, italicized, bold, and underlined. I've said it before. I'm going to say it again. I know I'm probably annoying people with this, but it bears repeating because people online won't stop asking. No, they will not be in Avengers Endgame. Avengers Endgame is done, shot, delivered. They could not do anything with the Fox characters because if they did, they would t- would have tanked the entire deal. Far From Home is filmed. It's done. They will not be in Far From Home. Anything that is in, there are a couple other movies that are, you know, in pre-production, getting ready to start shooting. They will likely not be in any of those films because the scripts are already done. It will likely be, if I had to put a ballpark guess on anything, when we will see it, maybe late 2021, 2022, before you see anything. Yeah, I have to agree. I mean, you're not going to see him in Avengers Endgame. The no. only way you might hear something is if they say the name Richards mm-hmm. or Xavier. Yep. But they're not going to tie into anything like that. It might be a throwaway line in a bonus scene, mm-hmm. maybe, but you're not going to see the characters. I can see that being done in a bonus throwaway scene where, like, you can get... Because it's real hard to get the main actors together for a, to shoot a bonus scene last minute. I mean, we heard about how hard it was to get them together to shoot the shawarma scene for Avengers. Where, mm-hmm. like, if you go back and watch the shawarma scene, uh, Chris Evans is deliberately not eating anything because he had, was in shape for his next movie. And this was, like, a super last minute thing. I can see it being, like, a you know, if you get Maria Hill... Or somebody like Major for Shield that like they mentioned and you know Xavier or Richards that like okay they're easy to get it's not going to be you know moving moving heaven and earth to get them in to film a bonus scene real late in the game I can see that maybe but as it stands you will not you know at no point will the Silver Surfer appear on screen in Endgame at no point will you know the Fantastic Four come swooping out of nowhere to save the day in, in Endgame it, no it won't happen yeah we just have to stress this because we do get up and we do get asked this question a lot so. We're, you know, for everybody who's listened to the podcast since day one, first, thank you. Second, we do just want to clarify for all the listeners, you're not going to see them show up on screen because mm-hmm. what Marvel is going to do, and I mean, I think they've been very kind of public about this too, is they're going to start recasting. Yep, they'll re- reboot. Like, you know, as, as good as some of the performances were for the X-Men movies, and I won't even say anything about the Fantastic Four movies because they're all, well, you know, uh, they're going to recast all the parts, all the actors, actresses, and just, you know, go from there now and in, in certain they might be a little bit of origin story the, or, the, or they might go the spider-man uh homecoming route and hey you already know who they are i have to agree i think that the only character that will be safe is deadpool by ryan Reynolds. yeah that's about the only one that'll make it through if they're gonna do deadpool 3 and i have not heard anything about no. that he's the only one that's going to be recast re- they'd be reprising they'd, the role they'd be making a mistake if they recast a Deadpool. But I but I don't think they're going to. I mean, no. that's, that's going to be one that we're going to have to just keep an eye on to see what the future is going to hold for that character. Because obviously with Disney now acquiring Fox, we don't know the fate of um, some of their edgier characters. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously with the Netflix shows being canceled. Yep. And well, that, Eric quotes canceled. Well, no, I mean, it was formally announced. Yeah. Punisher was yeah. and, and Jessica Jones. So those shows, I mean, there's a, a what a two year wait period. Two year wait period from the time the show finished airing. So for the Luke Cage, Iron Fist, and Daredevil, that is going to be 2020, and then for Jessica Jones and Punisher, that is going to be uh, 2021. Although I want to say Defenders could be sooner because of when that last season was. Although that was never officially canceled, so no, I believe it was like a, a, oh okay. A, I think everything was done. So yeah, so, yeah the sun. so so Defenders could be easily sooner because of when that last season aired yeah if anybody knows that official answer hit us up on the hashtag odph but going into it we don't know what's the fate of going to be the edgier characters Mm -hmm. there is a chance that you might see john bernthal reprise his role of frank castle i think he'd be willing to do it i think he would too it just depends on what the direction marvel wants to go now that they have the fox characters involved right right when they start going to streaming service if they're going to do it on disney plus or where i think they're going to go is i think they're going to go to hulu let's say could we get a punisher cable uh buddy tv show see i don't know if we'd have enough bullets for that show <laughs> i really don't but i will say this if and then i was actually going to segue this a little later now but yeah let's jump segments let's do it now so pad we know that the characters are coming over uh-huh it's going to be at least a year wait till we hear anything official probably yep. i will say arguably the soonest we might hear of casting and i'm going to make an unofficial guess here is new york comic-con that could be it'll be six months 
you know, we'll, we'll have to kind of that wait could and see. Be the Dark Phoenix will have been out and had its run in theaters by then. So, yeah. It's, it's quite possible you might hear some rumblings of casting down in New York Comic Con. But as we get these characters over, mm-hmm. who do you want to see on a TV show or who do you want to see uh, in a movie? I'd like to see one an X-Men team on a TV show. You know, don't do the major big ones. Maybe have one or two of the major characters appear every now and then. But I'd like to see something from the X-Men, you know, just because, yes, the X-Men movies have been good. But, like, I feel like they haven't been fleshed out enough. They're so, like, they're so, even if you just watch YouTube videos on some of the major X-Men storylines, there's so much more to the X-Men than just, you know, Cyclops, Storm, Beast, Xavier, Wolverine, you know, Gene. There's so much more to them than just those core characters. They're great, don't get me wrong, but there's so much more you can do with it that I feel like Fox never scratched the surface of. I have to agree. I mean, I'd like to see what incarnation of the X-Men they're going to do. Right. Because if they go with, like, the original giant-sized X-Men 1 team, yeah. you know, the classic Wolverine, yeah. uh, Colossus, Nightcrawler, Storm, mm-hmm. you know, the original Thunderbird, they want to try doing that storyline. And then, you know, I mean, obviously that was the prequel before the Phoenix Saga. Yeah. We won't even get into that. But if they wanted, like, to do, you know, an incarnation of that team or even more recent years, I mean, you have Bishop on the team, mm-hmm. Gambit, Rogue. I mean, there's so many different ways it can go, and especially if you want to get into current MCU times, there is a very big history with Rogue uh-huh. involving Captain Marvel, Carol Danvers. Yep. I don't want to spoil that for anybody, but I'm sure you can click around and you know dig up at your local comic book shop some issues and find out. Captain Marvel 3, calling it now. I would love to see that. Love to see that. But you're going to see you know the characters get intertwined with that. And when you're speaking about team-up shows, and I'm thinking the edge of your content. Mm-hmm. There is an old school book by Marvel did involving Wolverine, Punisher, and Ghost Rider. Oh, okay. It's called Hearts of Darkness. Okay. It was a one shot. Um, it was a you know in a prestige format, which is like a graphic novel. Sure. Um, it was a great story. Uh, and you want to talk about your you know three your, your most you know notorious characters in the MCU? Mm-hmm. This had it right down to the letter. Yeah, I'd say so. So I mean, that could be something that they want to try doing. You know, like a solo shot because. Obviously, they're not going to have the platform to really mm-hmm. expand on teams. And yeah. if you really want to redo the Avengers lineup, what's to say they're not going to add a Wolverine to it? Right. I mean, he's been an Avenger before. Yeah. What's to say that they're not going to have a little tie-in with the Fantastic Four and be able to do some of those epic stories that the Fantastic Four is involved in? Mm-hmm. I know the one I keep you know yelling and screaming about for the next big movie, and I think it's going to happen now, is the Jonathan Hickman Secret War story. Yep. I, I, I fully see that being like, <laughs> if it's not Avengers 5, it could be Avengers 6. Right. As far as I'm concerned. But I think that you're going to see that. And I think you're going to see the Fantastic Four get rebooted. Oh, yeah. And it, honestly, I'm really, I think that's the, the property I'm looking forward to the most. Yeah. They'll say, because like I said, there have been good X Men movies. Yeah, they've been hit or miss, but there have been some good ones in there. Name me a good Fantastic Four movie. Well, the first one was all right. Was all right for its time. For its yeah, for its time. Like it, like you look back and you try to watch it now. If you try to watch it now with every comic movie that has come out with Marvel and Fox and you know what have you, it's not good. But for its time and what was out or not out, I guess I should say, you know it was it, it was good. You know it, it was one of those movies that like at the time if it was like on FX on like a Saturday and you had nothing going on, eh, sure I'll watch it. But now eh, no. Yeah, it was one of those that, like I say, for its time, it served its purpose. It was a nice, fun film. It yeah. was, you know, I almost want to say, I don't want to say it was forgettable, but it was just one of those that, you know, for its time, and trying to really capture the Fantastic Four mm-hmm. is always tough to do. Yeah. Because they're so uh, such a unique team. Mm-hmm. The first family of comics, and just their different adventures. I mean, where they've gone. And, I mean, their stamp is all over the Marvel Universe. Oh, yeah. The comic universe. I mean, you look at Black Panther originated from there. The Inhumans originated from mm-hmm. there. And you want to just go down the lineage of, you know, the scrolls. Um, I'm, at least I'm pretty sure they did. And just, you know, Silver Surfer, Galactus. I mean, just how many just, you know, iconic characters and stories came mm-hmm. from the pages of Fantastic Four. Mm-hmm. So, obviously, to see them do a recasting, I think they're going to do it right. John Krasinski mm-hmm. from The Office. I'd love to see him as Reed Richards yeah. and Emily Blunt as uh, Sue Storm. I'll say, let me throw this one at you because he has shown he can be funny at times. Uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt as uh, Sue's brother. Human Torch. Human Torch. I'd be all for it. And you know what? I'll take a throwback. I will take Michael Chiklis back as Ben Grimm. I'd be all right with that. I loved he him was, as he, ben was, Grimm. he was good as Grimm. He was like my favorite part of the original yeah. Fantastic Four movies. Yeah. And then to flip the coin on the X-Men, I... Yeah. It, it just depends on what incarnation they want to See, do. It's hard to... That's the thing. You know, Fantastic Four movies have been... Yeah, eh, 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 you know. 
But with the X-Men movies, like, you know, for all the good and bad that were those film franchises, Patrick Stewart did such a good job as Xavier. Yeah. Like, it's 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 hard to recast that character and not compare him to, you know, Patrick Stewart. Well, it, you know, for those characters like Hugh Jackman and Patrick Stewart, whoever fills those roles... Like, like, don't get me wrong, James McAvoy has done a very good job. Oh, he's done a very good job, but yeah. if they're going to not elect to take him on this role and they decide to do a full recast, I mean, they're going to have a lot of pressure to deliver yeah. on those said roles. Yeah. That, I mean, just how they go with the X-Men is going to be just interesting how they mm-hmm. do the team. I think the only thing we know for certain is I fully suspect we'll see a Cyclops. I fully suspect we'll see a Jean Grey. Yep. I fully suspect we'll see a Wolverine. Oh, yeah. Everybody else is fair game, mm-hmm. pretty much, of who they want to mix and match on the teams. Yep. I th- in my personal opinion, they should do Storm. Yep. They should do Nightcrawler. They should do Colossus and Kitty Pryde. I'll say, well, Storm, the Storm, there's a natural introduction built in already. Mm-hmm. So with with Black Panther and all that. But no, yeah, I agree with you on the rest of them. Like, there's so much potential they can do there, and and just so much excitement I have for what they can do. Yeah, because obviously with the other TV properties they've done, they you know alluded to it in the Gifted, mm-hmm. and obviously with Legion doing its final season, they're going to introduce a version of yep. Professor X as they've announced. Mm-hmm. This is where, obviously, when you have characters that are going to get reintroduced and repackaged into the MCU and whatever that holds, because mm-hmm. in theory, everything ties together with TV and, and you know the Cloak and Dagger universe and the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and yep. what's going to happen there. Yep. Obviously, when you're recasting, there's going to be so many names involved and so many moving parts. Mm-hmm. You just really got to make sure you nail it. But, I mean, I think the biggest prior, you know primary target for the Marvel taking over the properties is going to be rebooting the Fantastic Four oh, yeah. and Doctor Doom. Yep. Who I'd love to see the actor who plays Jamie Lannister from Game of Thrones as Doctor Doom. Ooh, that'd be good. His name escapes me right now. I put down my phone. I'm not looking it up, but that's ooh, yeah. That's who I want to see yeah. do. It. And then where they go from there, I mean, it's anybody's guess. We don't know. I mean, the animated properties are going to, you mm-hmm. know, really have an interesting take too because I mean, for the most part they've been allowed to kind of borrow characters from other mm-hmm. universes. Yeah. But now with everything under one roof, that house of ideas is going to just fully explode. Well, so you can almost do like they did in the nineties with the animated series where like you had Wolverine show up on Spider-Man, the animated series, and you had, uh, you know, Iron Man make an appearance every now and then and stuff like that. Captain America, you, you can do this now. Yeah. But the fact we're going to be able to see a live screen. Yes. That's going to be wild. So obviously with this deal closing out, the door is going to be open for possibilities oh, yeah. galore. I mean, we're talking movies. We're talking Disney plus mm-hmm. we're talking if they move to Hulu, just everything is now a, a clean slate and almost like a, a re-snap, if you will, Yep. for the Fox characters moving over. The Fantastic Four is going to be a big primary target. Oh, yeah. So is the X-Men. Mm-hmm. But more importantly, let us know on that hashtag, hashtag ODPH, what characters are you most excited to see get introduced into the MCU? Where do you think they should go? A small screen show, a big screen movie? We want to know. Hit us up on that hashtag. Interact with us. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hey, what's going on, everybody? This is George Gatton. You are listening to the Ocho Duro Harley Hour Entertainment Edition. Coming back for the final little segment on this edition of the ODPH. Pat, kicks off as a one-shot. Well, I'm going to tie into the last segment a little bit. Uh, there was a Disney conference call for shareholders uh, this past week where uh, I got to toot my own horn. Called it! Bob Iger uh, broke down some questions or answered some questions about the upcoming Disney Plus streaming service. And one of the questions that was asked is, what movies will be on the Disney Plus streaming service? Because as we know, Disney has a vast and large and long uh film history from you know snow white the very first disney film up through zootopia frozen and a whole cast of other movies Uh, he did say that basically every movie would be on the disney plus streaming service so if you want to watch dumbo the original animated film at some point hey you can do that on disney plus streaming if you want to watch the rescuers down under personal favorite of mine you can do that on the disney plus streaming service like i said when this you know streaming service was announced you want to make money hand over fist put at put the disney film animation catalog on that streaming service because one of my biggest complaints is the disney vault yes it's a great business model and it has made them a lot of money over the years but this as bob Iger said you know it means the you know the disney vault is effectively dead because why buy a movie that doesn't come out except for once every 10 years when hey you can just go to the streaming service and watch it so that was a bit of exciting news in my opinion yeah i have to agree with you i just to try wrapping my head around that you're gonna have the entire disney library yeah on your on that streaming service, yeah. 
Let alone the Marvel one, yeah. let alone Star Wars. Star Wars and Fox once that deal goes through. Yeah. Uh huh. Mind is blown. Yep. And if I'm not mistaken, they're also going to put on the TV shows that they've done in the past on there. So you're going to have a lot of content on there. Do we have a, a date this is going to start running? Anything yet? No firm date. A lot of speculation is saying, you know, it is no firm dates, but it is coming this year. If I had to put a ballpark guess sometime after June. Okay. Nothing sooner after June, maybe early late fall. You know, it'd be perfect time. Comes out around Christmas. Uh huh. That could be. That'd be. I, I could see you coming out maybe October, November, right in time for the holiday season. Hey, you want the perfect gift for your son or daughter, or your family? Here you go. Let's just throw some karma out. New York Comic Con. Mm-hmm. Let's hope they do something down That'd there. That'd be nice. Uh, other bit of interesting news is the uh, there was a potential leak. Uh, this hasn't been confirmed by HBO or any of the showrunners, but there has been a potential leak of the episode runtimes for season eight of Game of Thrones. Uh, they follow in order of episodes one through six uh, are as follows. 54 minutes, 58 minutes, 60 minutes, 78 minutes, 80 minutes, and 80 minutes for the series finale. Well, if you're going to end an epic, you need to have epic run times. Uh huh. I I do not struggle Let's with say, this at all. That's kind of mind blowing though that like a television show is going to have an hour and twenty minute runtime, and now I realize there have been TV shows that have done two hour show times. That's you know cable television, folks. That is not eighty minutes straight like this is going to be. No, it's definitely not. I mean, trying to wrap my head around this is. <sighs> Just what to expect out of this, and especially the one thing that people have put together this week that uh-huh. I've noticed, especially online, the Battle of Winterfeld episode yeah. is coming out the same weekend as Avengers Affinity. Yeah. Or, and, and Game, rather. Yeah. Wrap your head around that for mm-hmm. a second, folks. Mm-hmm. That's going to be a lot of time spent in front of a TV or movie. I'll say, I'm just going to give you a bit, a bit of advice. Uh, if you're going to watch particularly these, these final three episodes where they're all over an hour long, uh, if you need some food, make sure you have it prepped and ready beforehand and make sure you have gone to the bathroom beforehand because, like I said, it's HBO. There ain't no commercial breaks on this ride. No, and but you know what? Just sitting there and just you know absorbing everything you're going to see on the screen mm-hmm. is going to be truly feel, mind-blowing. And I feel like it's going to take like multiple viewings to kind of fully... You know, oh yeah, get everything that's been on screen. Yeah, to do especially the Battle of Winterfeld. Mm-hmm. <sighs> Forget yep. about like that's gonna be a rewatch immediately for oh, like yeah. the next few days. Uh huh. I, I I fear when we have to break that episode down, like we might have to have a sole episode just for that. Probably. So going into my one shots, and let me touch upon Disney Plus one more time. Sure. Because there was a report that came out today that Marvel is looking to do a what if series oh okay now pat are you familiar with what if can't say i am no okay now this is going to be an animated series sure but there is a comic series done by marvel comics that comes out every now and then mm-hmm. and what it does it'll say what if spider-man was never bit by a spider oh okay oh i know okay i know something then somewhere. they do the story like that yeah it's and like, th- like the old star wars visionaries comics where it was what if darth vader survived the ending what if luke skywalker died on hoth yeah okay right so this is supposed to be coming i like that idea yeah this is coming out for disney plus um so this is gonna be an animated show so this is not going to be involving any sure, of the sure, live action sure so where they go from this don't really have a lot of details but i think right. it's a great idea i think it could do they, i think they could tie in the movies though they could like have movie scenarios where you know what if bucky actually died back in world war ii what if you know uh what if uh what is it uh speedster of brother of uh scarlet witch i'm blanking on his name oh quicksilver uh, quicksilver what if quicksilver didn't die I, I think they could do some loose tines with the mcu though well like we said i'm not sure exactly what the details are going to be the only thing that we've seen is it's reported to be animated okay and it's going to be on disney plus okay that's the only thing i can give concrete but there's so many different ways especially yeah. with all the stories they've done over the years yeah I mean, what if thanos never lost the infinity gauntlet what oh, if, lord you know what if the Avengers never formed? What? Let me help him out on that episode. What if Thanos never got, never lost the Infinity Gauntlet? Nothing good. End of episode. You know, it could be. It's something as simple as that. I mean, like, it would be just the ideas are endless. I mean, that's a great mm-hmm. thing about what if. I mean, they've done. I I know. What if what, Howard the Duck got the Infinity Gauntlet? Let us never think that. I just did. Ugh. Ugh. No. No. Gonna think happy thoughts. <laughs> gonna gonna close out the show talking about Deadly Class. Okay. Now you know I love the show on Sci-Fi, yes. and Rick Remender, who is the creator, or the writer of Deadly Class, yep. tweeted out, "Quote: Two thirds of our Deadly Class loyal million viewers watched the show over the weekend. Fun fact: 
Those numbers don't help our ratings much. Want to help ensure a season two? Watch the final amazing episodes live Wednesday nights on Sci-Fi. Retweet to help spread the word, end quote. This is true. A little bit of inside television. When you read articles about ratings, there are two different things. There is the initial watch rating. So that's the folks who watched it live the night it aired. So Walking Dead, for example, airs you know Sunday nights at 9 p.m. So there's the ratings that come out for the initial viewers. Then they also factor in, it's called Watch Plus 3, if I'm not mistaken, where those are the TiVos, the DVRs, the on-demands, where if you watch it either that same day or within three days after its initial airtime, that will factor into its ratings. Whereas, so Walking Dead again, Sunday's at 9 o'clock. If you watch it within those first three days, so you know Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you factor into those ratings. However, if you're watching it on, say, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, well, thanks for the viewing. You're not counting towards the ratings. Yeah, this is kind of really interesting to me. And, and like I say, I love the show. I love the comic done by Rick Remender yeah. and Wes Craig. Yeah. I, I'm a very big fan of it. And it's arguably such a close adaptation to screen to or book to screen, rather, mm-hmm. that, I mean, I can't speak enough nice things about it. I love right. the show. I love the acting on it. I love the writing. It's so 1980s, you know, punk rock feel to it. And just the whole school of of assassins and just the interaction. Mm -hmm. It's just so amazing. Like I just say, there's nothing like it on TV. I applaud sci-fi for doing this because especially they've really, and we've talked about this in past episodes, they've really stepped up their game about doing indie comics on the show, Mm -hmm. on their network. They they have a season two of Happy coming out, which I am extremely interested to see how this is all going to play out. Right. And with Deadly Class, I mean, like I said, when this came out, all we know, all we knew really kind of going into is if you haven't read the books, there was done by the executive produced by the Russo brothers. Mm -hmm. Those Russo brothers of Avengers fame. Yep. To see the show, and I watch every week, I'm live tweeting at OD Parlay Hour. I can't speak enough nice things about the show Mm -hmm. and everything involved with it. So I am going to make the plea to you, the listeners. If you have the ability to watch it, it's Wednesday night, 10 p.m. on the Eastern Coast, Eastern Standard Time Zone on Sci-Fi. Check your local listings. Watch it. Let's make sure we're pushing for a season two. I want to see it. You should, too. It's a great show. Can't recommend it enough. It's There's nothing like it on TV right now. Mm-hmm. So definitely, definitely, definitely make sure you're watching Wednesday night and make sure you're tweeting at Sci-Fi at S-Y-F-Y, mm-hmm. Renew Deadly Class. Hashtag Renew Deadly Clash. Hashtag Deadly Class Season 2. Let's make it happen, folks. That's all we got for this week. So for Padawan J. Thank you, thank you. I'm your host, Ken M. Thank you, as always, for listening to the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. Hashtag ODPH Podcast. We'll see you next time. (laughs) 